Hi, I'm Jake Langsley, and this is the third and final year of our demonstration grant that we did through the Minnesota Department of Agriculture Sustainability Demonstration Grant. Uh, our topic was winter grazing of goats, controlling vege vegetation while also saving on supplemental feeding costs. This video, we are going to just focus on the stuff that we've learned over these last three years, uh, areas that we would like to see more research being done and we're just going to take a tour throughout the field today. We had hoped to originally be out when um, the snow was on the ground. Uh, we had a pretty light amount of snow up until January and February. We got really dumped on some uh, multiple feet of snow. Uh, it proved to be pretty challenging. Didn't really make it very conducive to see the plants that we wanted to see and also the, the camera equipment wouldn't have worked as well as we had liked in the cold temperatures. So, so today we're just going to take a tour around the field, stopping at various uh, topics and talking about them. Okay, one of the things we learned in the first couple years was really trying to uh, spread the goats out. The first few seasons we had more of a wintering ground, we had feeders, and they kind of congregated. They hung out really close to the shelters and weren't, you know, just as motivated to go walk out in the snow. And that's one thing with goats. If you don't give them a reason to walk in the snow, they're really not going to go out and uh, jump out of bed and try to go, go eat some brush with deep snow. So what we noticed on this hillside here was that there was uh, some of the sumac really wasn't getting hit to like we'd like to see so then we brought uh, a round bale up here set some hay you can see some of the residual leftover hay here and uh, as soon as we set that instantly right around the uh, hay there they were really working really hard and just kind of got going on this hillside and they've got really good coverage from there uh, almost every stem that I look through when I'm walking through here uh, girdled the ones that you don't see the bright white on you just those are last years and you can grab them and they snap off and you can see they're completely dead another interesting uh, feature in this field there's not a ton of oak trees out here but there's a couple this tree right behind me here has been in the field for a while now so it's gone through three winters and as you can see they ate the leaves off and the lower branches and they weren't able to reach up tall but what I like about this is that uh, it looked like one goat came and took like a couple calibration bites and stopped. Uh, either it didn't taste good or it wasn't really good nutritional content, but left the rest of the tree fine. It's still growing nice and healthy. Yet all the sumac, the buckthorn, the honeysuckle that's out here, uh, they've really done a good job of eating that bark during the project time. And this tree, it's actually, like I said, a red oak and actually has some pretty pretty thin bark compared to um, normally these are more in the forest environment not out in your oak savannas but if this were a bur oak I would suspect and have seen in uh, our years of uh, experience that they have not gone after bur oak at all and just looking at this red oak here that they've really not gone after it very well in terms of going after the bark which is the main thing that we're going after in the winter time so I'm really happy with these results how they ate the, like I said, kind of did a little bottom trimming for us here, let the top keep growing, and uh, took some of these other uh, plants that were kind of competing with it. And a lot of this was really well hit well. They ate the, the tops of the sumac off, and some of these ones don't look like they're chewed up. You just come and break, because these are last years that are nice and crispy, uh, the stalks and the stems from the previous years. Here we have a cedar tree, actually, only cedar tree in the entire area so it's a pretty small sample size but all three years they've thoroughly enjoyed eating all accessible green parts of this tree and you can see kind of the browse line where they weren't able to get above that um, I think previous years we had a little bit of girdling going on but I, as you can know notice here I don't really see too much yet you can see a little bit was done on the one side but you really need to get all the way around to really impact the tree so the back side looks like it didn't get hit here so this is still growing but uh, yeah just another type of tree out in the field thought we'd give a, a quick uh, overview on but again it's only this, the only tree out here but uh, if they were smaller I believe it had it able to impact them this one looks like it's kind of getting a little bit older the bark's getting a little bit more sh shaggy so probably less likely to girdle whereas you can see they did girdle this branch here because it's one of the offshoots of the plant that's probably a little bit more tender so if you had some younger cedar trees I would believe that they would go after that bark much more readily and here we have the 
brush or shrub that I am most excited about with this whole project is the honeysuckle. These uh, bush exotic uh, bushes are growing kind of everywhere around Minnesota and we graze these a lot in the summer but I really don't think it does kind of weaken them over time you know repeated grazings but this winter honeysuckle getting the goats to actually strip the bark of the honeysuckle has just been in my opinion just a phenomenal success so we have a pretty big honeysuckle plant in year one or year two you can see these darker branches those are the ones that were stripped either year one or year two and then you have all these re-sprouts these tiny little re-sprouts that are coming off of that and then you can see I, I think they hit these in the fall actually but they got in and stripped the bark of all these re-sprouts the next year and I think it's just really cool how they're able to get their head in between this tangled mass and get to the bark inside and just super excited about how fast that uh, you can see this is nice and crispy some of these other previous seasons here so it's just really awesome to see all right and we have a box elder tree here just kind of a one of the larger samples here of where they went after the bark on them. You can see some of these are the uh, re-sprouts and they really, really, really love these. Here's a, I don't know if this is getting too close. Last year, year, I think year two, number one or two, we cut this just to see what happened, just to give them some food. And then you can see how this re-sprouted back and then they really love to eat the tips off of the, uh, the tender tips and then they really love to work the bark of that uh, new growth. And here's a really good example back here. Actually, they had pretty much coverage on all these box elders in this whole draw here. But uh, here's another example where they really got the bark on all the re-sprouts and ate all the uh, tips off of it. So this plant is definitely hurting. All right, and here we have a red osier dogwood, which is a native. Uh, every year they hit these pretty hard. The wild white-tailed deer also hit these pretty good. Um, very palatable. And these plants seem to really kind of sprout back. But again, a lot of these uh, open prairie situations, you want to start to get some of the, uh, the brush or set it back so some of these plants uh, definitely could be set back a little bit and you can see how well they did at stripping the bark on these and getting all the way around these tiny little twigs uh, of growth all right and here we have a christmas tree we put some of these out we have a christmas tree recycling program and you can see how they chewed the bark ate the greenery this year we learned had uh, some of the department stores drop 300 trees right in the ditch and use a skid loader to push them in and it just went a lot faster one other thing i really wanted to talk about was goat breeds and the type of goat for this type of winter grazing winter browsing We've really gravitated and really love the Spanish goat breed. It's a very hardy, old, traditional type breed. And really looking for ones that have really thick cashmere. They really fluff out, really get nice and fuzzy, almost kind of look like a sheep. And we really find them, you know, they're not shivering as much in the wintertime. And they just do really well at really getting at to the brush. Um, I, I really would caution you with using some of the dairy breeds, which we do have some that mix in, and I'm not trying to put a blanket statement on all breeds or which ones are better than not, but I think the, the dairy breeds are definitely going to be much more challenging. They just don't really have the fur coat. They're more, they belong more in a barn situation with kind of, you know, heavy alfalfa hay to really produce the milk. And so I would not recommend using dairy breeds. If you do, again, this would be adding a pen on to a, a really nice warm barn with really good bedding that they can get back into. Um, so just really trying to look at your breeds, the meat breeds, I think if you stick with those, especially the Spanish goats. I know uh, others have had luck with Kikos. We don't really have a lot of Kikos here, but the, the Spanish goats have been working really well for us. Some of the boars, I would say that they're probably medium. We've had some really good boars and also ones that have struggled a little bit that we've had to sell to other types of uh, places that uh, have a little bit more of a closed facility. So just really want to watch that. And again, really stressing to really focus on using adult animals uh, anything under I would say a year and a half under a year old uh, they really need to be in a, in a, a really much more uh, substantial barn 
warmer area. Um, some of our goats were warm uh, winter here. Uh, some of them we're going to actually start sending south to say Oklahoma and such just because it, they're a lot of work with the younger ones. So just really want to make sure you, you watch that and just really go out and what I like to do on the really cold days is go out and just kind of monitor see how well they're feeding see if any of them are hanging off alone try to see if uh, um, any of them are excessively shivering and uh, just those type of things that you can just kind of watch for and then know that those one those animals need to be brought back or closer to home and not kind of out out working on the land all right, now I'm gonna talk about shelters. This is the calf hut that we, the style that we use. This is a full size. We also used a half size, which we'll show you in a bit. Um, early in the season, we're up kind of on one of the higher slopes, gets a lot of sun here. This is kind of where we started with our home base, with our camp, and this year we moved our shelters around uh, our uh, staging areas around the property. The previous years, we kind of had one end of the property that we fed them and also put the shelters, but this year we really moved them around. I uh, really love these. They're, when we're moving them around, they're pretty, very, very tough. Um, but I just wanted to point out that they do have their limitations. I moved a lot of huts all winter, and this is the only one that happened to, but I don't know, it was probably 20, 30 below, and we had some pretty deep crusted snow, and I, w I usually hook a, a strap with my four-wheeler through the holes here and just kind of drag them around the field. And as you can see, this one the, uh, made it a sunroof now on this hut. So um, just got to kind of watch out for that, especially when it's really cold, I notice. If it's warmer, you're, you have much better, better luck with that. And uh, I think I heard a couple goats in here. I don't know if they're still in here or not. Oh, looks like a couple that missed the herd there. Okay, next I wanted to talk about feeding systems that we used over the, the uh, project time. This is a, uh, a feeder here uh, made in Minnesota and uh, it uh, helps keep the, the hay up off the ground. It's got a nice tilt to it so you can put a round bale on this side. It has a, a, a kind of the bar space just right to, to allow the goats to kind of go in there and feed. And we used these the, the first two years, really didn't use it this last year, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, just kind of an add-on. This doesn't come with the feeder, but we put some uh, netting. We use this with our horses, a slow, uh, slow feed netting, and was really wanting to try to find a way we can get you know some netting to work to really cut back on hay. And I had heard in the past that the horn, goat horns can get caught in there and just kind of wanted to do a little sample. So we put this feeder in uh, with a couple just to try it for a night. And it wasn't the horns, it's the ear tags. And oh my gosh, come out the next day and or, uh, I watched them for a couple hours there and then one couple the next day where they got their ear tags caught in there we'd have to untangle them. Luckily they didn't tear them because they were smaller goats, but just made us realize that if you have any type of tagged animals, the netting does not go too well. And uh, with the feeder here, even you know, the other years we didn't have the netting, we just put the hay right inside here. And, we're still finding that we had to come out and rake the hay down and um, kind of keep it more accessible because they would eat the sides and they wouldn't really eat the center. Uh, I think this is really good for like small farms or smaller operations, but when you start to get you know larger and larger amounts of goats and you want your goats to have really good access to uh, the hay in the winter time, so you don't want any limitations. So we kind of did a different style, which we'll show next. All right, and here we have our hay bales with a couple goats left over from winter. Uh, they keep following us around for some reason. So this is the style that we went to this year. Um, again, we're moving the hay, we're setting these round bales out around the, the hill, and I really love the, the wrapped round bales. So this one, as you can see, we have it tipped kind of the opposite, kind of tipped up on its end. And this is one way we can kind of control uh, how much we feed and when we feed in the landscape with just the hay bale. So right now we have it up taller, so the only really the taller goats can kind of really get access to it. It's been really warm and mild lately, so we're just kind of cutting back on hay. And there's a lot of new green that's just starting to sprout out. Um, so typically when we're feeding this, we'd have this tipped over. So it'd be sitting like a normal hay bale would be. And we have the plastic over the top and then the goats would eat from both ends and work their way in. Uh, originally, I was always kind of concerned that maybe that it would kind of crush or fall on them. We never really had that problem at all. Basically because there's kind of a crust 
around the hay bale and most round bales and it, it stayed hard and kind of froze or at least our bales did here so they eat that and they kind of work their way out and then eventually it will slowly kind of seep and fall down and uh, then they'll still work from both sides and then after I see that for a while I can go and cut the top of it and open it up or sometimes I'll take the skid loader with the bale spear and just kind of shake it up when I'm out on the field out in the field and spread it out a little bit more but really like that because it also again kind of allows us to control when to feed and when not to I think the ideal if you can do it would be to have a completely wrapped bale all the way around individually wrapped so have them all staged out in the field all completely wrapped keeps the deer off of them keeps the goats off of them we haven't found them to tear through this plastic and then you can just go and cut uh, the hay bales that you would like to uh, feed at that time where these ones were wrapped in a long row which is usually pretty typical so both ends were exposed but it was better than being wide open because in the past what we'd have was the goats would climb up on the top and they would pee on the top but this kind of created once it's tipped on its side again that it just kind of created some extra shelter from the elements from the goats and worked really well the only thing is in the springtime now we'll just have to go out and pick some of the plastic up and get into a recycling facility but um, again really really we're happy with that uh, with this method it was just much more free access for us the, again the feeders we found they really kind of congregated uh, kind of hung out a little bit too tight than we'd like to see and we were able to again move these around the field and uh, if you really they really slide really well on the snow too once uh, if you have some snow or ice and you kind of need to push them around this uh, plastic on the snow just really slides really nice and makes it really easy to move around all right as you can see we have the hay bale and some of the goats are starting to join us up here and one thing we really kind of watch is behaviors I'm seeing how fast they really go after the hay this is why we have this hay bale kind of tipped up again because they're really not too interested in the hay they're still finding plenty to, to eat out on the landscape so we don't want to overfeed them we want to get them too reliant on eating hay and you can see uh, there's just a couple picking here but the majority of the herds kind of moved on here and just took a qu couple quick bites so it's really about pacing yourself and just kind of watching the behavior of the goats and knowing when to feed watching the weather when it looks like a nice warm spell um, getting kind of cut it back a little bit and just watching the healthier goats we've got a lot of a lot of pregnant goats that did very well uh, throughout the year here throughout this winter season and it's just uh, when we see a big storm coming in or rain then we really make sure we have a uh, really good access to feed one th more thing I'd like to add about the round bale system when you're putting them out in the landscape in the past we used to kind of stick them up into trees or buckthorn or um, in thicker brush but you just really got to be careful that they kind of stay that they can't really shift um, you don't want them to come be falling we, we found it best just to put it find a really flat area put it how it's supposed to be on a flat area just so that it you it doesn't all of a sudden just fall on top of a goat all right and this is kind of a, a version of our base camp and we got a couple goats still that left over from the winter here again but this is what we came up with our, our setup that we liked the best. So the prevailing northwest wind was kind of coming this way. We would make a, uh, the huts kind of a, a U shape around the bedding. And we used either corn stalks or bean stubble. <laughs> and I liked it, kind of have it in the middle because uh, then we could just kind of take it off and throw it in the huts and still leave room to get around and uh, check on them that way. Um, with the not so much of the bean straw with the corn straw we kind of like to keep it up most of the time it'd just be snow on it because they did like to pick through the corn and would kind of rip uh, rip it apart so there'd be times where I would cut it and kind of let them stir it up and basically made a bedding area out front kind of a porch area where they could sit in the Sun and then um, yeah and then we would just keep adding dry bedding to this uh, again when it's cold in the winter that's one nice thing is that snow keeps it uh, the cooler temperatures keeps it nice and dry so you can keep adding dry bedding on top of that and we just found that to be the best really kind of keeping the houses close together so when one fills up they kind of go to the next one we did have them early in the year where we had a little bit more spread out and we would see certain goats would favor certain huts over others so it's uh worked really well and we can move this whole system move these bales move these huts around the field 
This area in particular was our deep winter area. The uh, goats kind of just told us where to go and that's what I really love about this 30 acre area. We have a lot of rolling hills and some different draws and um, this area got the least amount of wind. This is where the goats wanted to hang out when we had the really, really cold temperatures the uh, 30, I think we were 38 below or I don't remember where we ever ended up being. And then also the big blizzard, the wind was, I came down that day, the wind was just blowing and snow was blowing everywhere. And we were able to uh, keep the goats down here, keep them out of the wind and feed them kind of close into their huts here so they didn't have to go too far during the really cold times. All right, I wanted to talk a little bit more about hay. So we already talked about how we can put it out in a bale form with the wrap and that seemed to work really well for us. Also, can do the unrolling method, which nothing new, obviously just unrolling the bale. And this is what we did here. You can kind of see some of the remnants. Um, this method works really well, like I'd say right before uh, something like a storm or something, but you really gotta be careful when you do this because if you get dumped on with snow and it gets I don't know, maybe three, three or four inches on the top. They will burrow down to some extent, but they really don't seem to want to really, really burrow in the snow. So you kind of catch yourself and as things thaw out, they do pick at it, but I just still feel they don't eat quite as much as they would um, if you had it, had it uh, in an, a more confined area. Um, and also another part of it too is really how easy it is to unroll. Uh, we had a really hard time with hay this year uh, finding hay we you know thought we had it secure and you don't get calls or all of a sudden they can't find any or whatever so it was really rough um, challenge so I'd recommend and what we're doing in the future is you know having the hay on the ground and not just that verbal agreement actually having it on your house going out in the summertime or the, the cutting seasons collecting it having it at your place getting it wrapped is kind of the method that I'm gonna go to because even some of the people you think uh, Normally you're going to bring you the hay, didn't bring hay this year, so it was kind of challenging. So just say all that because this hay, although we went higher quality, kind of an alfalfa mix this year, it was um, kind of hard to unroll just the way it was and it would just kind of, it just didn't unroll very easily. So that's why we really didn't do it as much. I still think there are places it is nice to kind of spread it out thin and uh, you know spread it out on the landscape more to really kind of help the soil health but you just kind of have to really watch yourself when you're doing that. Another very helpful tool which is not required but uh, having a herding dog so this is our border collie herding dog Bailey and really don't worry about goats getting out anymore she has a, the ability to kind of smell them and track them and also to round them up relatively easy for us. Come here. Stay. Lie down. Lie down. Lie down. Lie down. Lie down. Stay. Let's see. Over. Come by. Good girl. Back, back, good girl. Lie down, stay. Lie down, stay. Okay. Lie down, lie down, lie down, lie down. There you go. Come by. Good girl. That a girl. One other thing I wanted to mention, uh, we also did some protectant or we tried to, you know, use type of sprays or cages or certain types of things, deterrents to keep the goats off of certain plants. And honestly, in this project site, uh, the main plants that we were working on are the sumac, the honeysuckle, the buckthorn, and a lot of the, the oaks or the, the older established plants are already here. They weren't impacting, so we really didn't need to do much deterrence on. Uh, we still did do some. We found that uh, the sprays 
like your your deer deterrence type spray bottles or a real challenge uh, they were totally freezing up on me as I'm trying to spray them in the winter time and we were we did spray a couple Christmas trees and kind of having mixed results wasn't sure if that was really the uh, the best way to uh, to work on that we don't know how long that would really hold up throughout the season or how often you'd have to do that it might be kind of labor intensive we did use the tree wraps so the kind of the spiral ones and those worked relatively okay the goats did still have the ability to use their horns and kind of scratch them off the best method that um, Cheryl Culberth of Landscape Restorations used was doing a, a cage actually kind of like a just think of like a tomato cage out of metal around it with some support stakes to really keep the goats off and the deer off as well and that worked really really well to kind of keep some of those plants just try to get them up above the browse line to give them a little bit more uh, freedom to grow all right so now we're going to get to the end here um, this is the report that you will find if you look up the green book uh, through the minnesota department of agriculture I understand that everybody likes to read and are more, some people gravitate more to video like myself. So I'm just gonna kind of sum up some of the report. You can get the full report again by uh, looking up the green book. Uh, this is the 2000, uh, 2018 annual and final report for our project. And just kind of some results. I'm just gonna talk about some of the plus and minuses that we found on this project. Um, just looking at this winter in general, I feel every year we learned a little bit and made modifications and we're getting more and more uh, impact on the vegetation. This uh, fall and winter was kind of unique. The November, December was relatively mild, uh, relatively small snowpack. Even into early January, uh, there was many times we didn't have a lot of snow on the ground. And we found that we had just really phenomenal coverage of the goats getting into every little corner of this, uh, the, the project site. So it was really cool to see them move around. Once that snow hit, it kind of started kind of in January and then that February we've got, I think, close to three feet of snow around here. Really uh, restricted what the goats were going to do. They definitely hung out more around the, uh, the shelters and such and we really had to kind of move the hay bales to kind of move them. And those really, really cold times, those are the times where you just kind of want to keep the troops close, keep them in their shelters and really can't really go do a ton of uh, vegetation work at that time. And uh, just understanding there's certain times when you you go at it and certain times you, you kind of retreat uh, this year I think we were close to uh, 60 yeah 32 degree negative 32 degree Fahrenheit and then also negative 65 wind chill uh, at times so it was de definitely definitely challenging some uh, management tips that uh, we kind of came up with over the year is kind of how to feed hay. I already kind of talked about that as we were walking through, but really had a good, good experience of moving the hay around. And if I were to do, if this is a four-year project and I was doing it again next year, I would love to see this whole field stocked with hay, individually wrapped, kind of throughout the field that we would go and cut as needed. So that way we wouldn't have to go out and place them in the snow and in kind of how we had it go. And with the deep snow in February, we actually had to put, uh, usually I can just put two chains on the skid loader on, the, on two tires. I actually had to put chains on all four tires just to kind of move around and it was really a challenge and had to actually plow, plow paths and stuff like that. So just thinking back, um, and, and every other winter wasn't really an issue. I'm glad we kind of had that at the very end just to kind of really test us. But I think if you had your hay, had it out, and then if you don't use it, that's a nice thing. If it's already wrapped, individually wrapped, if you can, then uh, use it next year or sell it or use or just pick it up at the end of the, when everything melts and dries out kind of this time of year. I think that would work really well. Uh, how to place the shelters, kind of talked about that again. Um, we did that ring with the bedding. I really recommend that you sort the animals in size classes. So have your adults who use mostly, almost all adults on the project site here. I will say that some of the younger animals, uh, you know, with some of the cold, we did have some losses that you kind of have to watch out for. So if you're gonna do out grazing in the winter time, uh, if you're just getting started, I would start with weathers. If you have access to them, they're very tough. They don't really need a lot to maintain their body and they're not pregnant or have that kind of taxing on their body and, and they have and done really well for us. And then the next would be the, uh, the, uh, the bucks and the nannies, the adult nannies, and they did really well. Uh, despite the colder temperatures, it's just the smaller, smaller classes that, of livestock that you really got to watch. Uh, mainly, 
just trying to prevent them from trying to uh, pile or, or panic in a, in a really cold situation. Um, that's just one thing you really kind of have to watch out for. Uh, one really cool thing about this project was the fencing. So when I first tried kind of putting fencing out, I didn't have trained livestock. I, the first time I tried to put this e-net fencing out was in the winter time and uh, had a lot of goats just kind of totally escape on me. I was just really learning. I didn't really know a lot at the time and um, was kind of put a damper in myself as far as um, what, uh, how well it'd be to put fencing up in the winter. And since then we've been playing with that and really, really happy on this three years never really had an escape per se so that was really nice to see the the fencing system worked really well um honestly this last year we really did we really didn't have to uh we had really didn't have to watch our voltage as close as we did so it was really nice uh there i wouldn't normally recommend this but there are many times that the fence was off but these goats again have been trained for many years lit working in this type of system and even at the point when we had three feet of snow and it had five foot drifts going across those points where we couldn't even see the fence anymore. And the way that we manage for that is we just feed them in the middle of the field. So, and what, where their food and their shelter are, they're gonna hang out. We didn't see them really trying to stray and try to go and escape in the winter time. Again, just really sticking where the food sources were. And then as the snow melts and the poles kind of start to thaw out, that's when you can go out and kind of touch them up like we did on this project site. And was just really, really impressed on how well we could keep the animals in in the winter time. So next I'm gonna talk about outreach. Part of these projects, they really wanna know that you're getting people out to check on things or see things. And then that's another reason that we really pushed to be able to do this uh, YouTube series through the grant to also help get the word out. Uh, through this last 2018 here, we had um, uh, Care 11 did come down and did a story out on this winter grazing uh, and also talking about our Christmas tree recycling program was primarily the reason they came down, but we we're also able to show some things that the goats were working on, some of the buckthorn that they were able to girdle. Um, I also did some speaking at the Upper Midwest Invasive Species Conference, talked about this project there. And also we had a unique opportunity with the Society for Rangeland Management that came to Minneapolis this year and was able to talk about that at the seminar and also lead a field trip. Uh, we had a bus field trip that came down and we were able to walk in the, uh, I think we, we did that on actually Valentine's Day on February 14th in uh, 2019 here. So we had uh, approximately 40 people on the tour that were able to walk and many people from Canada and all around the country that got to kind of see see this project in action and also did some speaking in uh, the Minnesota Sustainable Farming Association so just really trying to get the uh, get the word out about uh, this project finally I wanted to talk about the field tour we do have some pictures we're gonna mix in with this video but uh, some of the questions they were just curious what did the, the visitors get to see and learn on our field tour if you were able to come we, uh, we, we did an indoor venue at the Cheese Caves in Faribault and had a really nice time there uh, sampling some of the cheeses and did a PowerPoint kind of explaining a lot of the stuff that we talked about in this video and then we had a chance to come out and see it. What was the weather like? It was sunny, breezy, and about 20 degrees. And uh, we just kind of had a, a storm before uh, that the night before, so it kind of did make some travel impact um, as far as attendance there. Had about 14 people show up to walk around the field. Again, it was a very challenging situation. We had a lot of snow. I had to plow with a, a bobcat to make lanes so that people could actually walk around out there. And it was a uh, pretty, pretty stiff wind but uh, we were able to see that. And again, we were gonna try to do this vi video that time, but it was just too cold for the camera equipment and we weren't really gonna get good coverage of the plants. Uh, was this a good time of year for a field day? Uh, winter grazing, I guess you kinda had to do the tour in the winter time. Um, I'd like to have seen it maybe a little bit a little bit later in the year but I know they needed to get the green book done and they're actually waiting for our project to get finished so that they could get the green book done so they we want they kind of wanted it wrapped up by the end of March there so or early March so we had to kind of push to get that done and uh, so really didn't have an option but I think just a little bit better weather would have been a, a good thing to have and uh, 
what do we think we can do to help uh, get more outreach and just basically what we're doing right now shooting this video and trying to get some discussion I really encourage you to have comment on this uh, video if you have any questions to try to go back and, and watch the previous years and you can kind of see how this uh, project has uh, progressed over the years. This was a fun project. We learned a lot and uh, really hope to keep the concept of using animals or out pasturing animals and getting them to work, especially goats in the wintertime. Uh, really feel that they had better quality of life moving around this field, had a lot more access to different types of nutrition, different types of plants other than the, the hay that they normally are fed. Had free choice mineral out here, access to water, and it was just a, a, a good system. I uh, really wanted to kind of thank some of our sponsors that helped with this. So again, the overarching uh, group was the Minnesota Department of Agriculture Sustainability Demonstration Grant, which we were a part of. I also like to uh, thank uh, Hiawatha Valley RCND and John Beckwith. He was kind of the uh, the person that really worked with uh, the background and, and uh, kind of doing more of the paperwork. While, so that allowed me as a producer uh, to be able to kind of focus on that and it was really a good uh, partnership. I'd also like to uh, thank Cheryl Culbreth from Landscape Restorations who came out and was able to do some plant surveys, kind of look at certain plants and uh, did some, uh, some protective uh, type things and some wraps and some putting some cages around particular plants that uh, were so we were able to try to um, save some of the natives so again want to thank all them for helping with this project all right this is the the final wrap here closing out the project i uh, hope to be a part of other projects in the future and um, really think that the information we learned from this project is really going to be very beneficial to land managers or people that are managing the land around Minnesota, private landowners, parks, uh, that type of thing. The, the nice thing that we really like to point out with this project is this is like a 30 acre site, approximately 30 acres as far as you can see in the background. And the goats were able to go after the woody vegetation and we were able to use less goats in a shorter amount of time. I firmly believe impact the, the brush or the, the, uh, the woody species much more severely versus defoliating. While defoliating does do a good job over time, I just really feel this bark stripping in the winter time is gonna be real key to managing land at a large scale in Minnesota. Really, really firmly believe that one day we're gonna really look at grazing as being kind of more the driver that kept these areas and plains and oak savannas open. Uh, and in particular, the browsing of winter animals, which we've lost in Minnesota, which, which we've talked about in previous videos, but losing the, the Eastern elk and these other pronghorn, these other species that used to strip the bark of a lot of these fast growing problematic plants that we have around Minnesota. So just really excited to really put more focus and energy to getting more goats working out on the land in, in Minnesota. And then people at home, if you have just a, a small herd of goats or you know just a small homestead, have a couple goats, just knowing that you have the ability to run some of this fencing system off of what you already have, your barn or your, your, uh, your, your hard panel area, and just giving the goats the freedom to work on some of this browse and brush, which is very nutritious for the animal and, and does a really good job of kind of impacting and managing the land for you. So hope to see more people doing this practice. Again, really uh, encourage you to comment on these videos, try to follow along. We have a, a network called e Ecological Service Livestock Network that uh, was one of the members to help uh, start and form in Minnesota. We, we work through the Sustainable Farm Association in Minnesota. We, we kind of work under them. So look those groups up and find a way to be part of the, part of the, the family.